All right, Werner Vogels, um, Chief Technology Officer uh, for Amazon. It's it's great to have you with me. So thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, you've got some predictions, uh, and especially this year in 2020, with as crazy as things have been. I think we need yep. predictions. <laughs> we need some sense that the future is knowable. So um, I, I want to get straight into that. And you, you start with a prediction that the cloud will be everywhere, I, I suppose. How more than it is already? Well, you know, one of the things you have to think about here is that, um, you know, if I would have done predictions last year, I would have obviously missed everything. Yeah, so these are still predictions. So some of the things in, in the predictions are sort of um, sort of trends that are already in progress. But I think one of the things that we clearly see, if you look back at some of how you, many people think about the cloud, is as sort of a, a set of centralized data centers somewhere. The, the cloud is somewhere else. And of course, by now, we call them regions, the collections of data centers or availability zones. Um, and of course, you know, in the early days, 2006, there were only one or two of these regions. Uh, now there's 24 of those, but they still look like somewhat of a centralized place yeah? and you still need to get to it. And I think that's one of the things that we've tried to solve because one of the, the, the challenges we all face is still the speed of light. Yeah, and if you really want to get sort of computing and, and functionality close to your customers, because more and more latency, low latency matters, then you need to move out towards what we call the edge. And so I can't hear you. So tell me, how how is this uh, going to end up in a strategic difference between the way Amazon uh, architects things and the way others are doing it? Well, first and foremost, you have to think about sort of take 5G, for example, you know, ultra low latency, um, very high parallel number of co connections, and then you hit your 5G access point very quickly, but then you still need to go over the internet to where actually the backends of your applications live. Um, and by moving the cloud into the 5G access points means that you can start building very low latency connections. And especially, I think 5G is, of course, something that we as consumers look forward to. But I think the major use case for 5G will be machine to machine. Yeah, whether it's your car driving or whether it is sort of home automation or private 5G networks. Um, and as such, low latency starts to matter there. And it's all the reliability. And so the closer you can move your compute or the functionality of your applications closer to where the ultimate users of it are, will be great, great benefit. And whether that is uh, in 5G access points or whether it is antennas towards satellites or whether it is you are a um, your researcher in Antarctica and you do not have an internet connection at all. And so we ship these devices around. Hmm. For example, that, that actually are, that look like the cloud, it functions like the cloud, it has the same programming model as that the cloud has, but it is just a box sitting in your, in your research. And whether that is whether you're on your ship somewhere or whether you're in an airplane or all these kind of cases where you may not necessarily want to go back immediately to the centralized cloud, but you may want to do computing at the edge. And so, for example, there are many customers in the mining industry and they built these massive autonomous trucks that do all sorts of very dangerous tasks with, with no humans on them. And so we, we built a system for them, an IoT system called Greengrass that has exactly the same capabilities as the cloud. So you, you develop in the cloud, but you deploy it on these machines. These machines are completely autonomous, no interconnection, no internet connection. They go into the mines, do their tasks, come back with a lot of data that you would like to analyze. But also the operations on the truck itself, it still looks like cloud, it's just on your machine itself. Well, you the, say, thing, the other things that, that sort of that, that we see happening is that this, this this boundary between what we consider to be digital and what we consider to be physical machines or, or our analog world around us, those that's gonna emerge. We're no longer gonna see what is digital and what is really physical. And, and so if you have a Tesla, it's obvious that this is a computer on wheels. Right. Yeah. I mean, it looks like it. 
However, you know, I just saw one of the new Audis and it has 1,200 sensors on board. Long range radar, short range radar, many cameras around it. And, and, but it still looks like a very traditional car. Yeah, like, like Audi, very high end, luxury, beautiful. It doesn't look like a computer on wheels, yet it is. Hmm. And so to be able to sort of run all the compute, for example, the machine learning models that need to process all the, the data that's coming in and stuff like that, you don't want to go back to the cloud for that. You want that to be in the car itself. Well, I want to get to that, that, that sort of fits some of what you were saying fits into your second prediction, which has to do with machine learning. You yeah. say that there's going to be more data produced in the next three years than was in the past 30. Uh, a lot of this is going to be in shorter bursts, right? With the machine to machine communication, they're not necessarily going to be sending each other a lot of you know, Netflix series. Um, it, it's that constant communication. Uh, it's it's um, the, the, there's, there's an interesting trend there. Um, where in the past we would think that we would have very need very dedicated sensors for everything, yeah. And and so you'd think about the new cars, twelve hundred sensors. What we what do we do with the other five billion cars or ten billion cars? I don't know how they are that are on the road and don't have these sensors. Well, it turns out that the number of of data streams that we've been using in the past are now ideal for analytics. Audio, video, imagery. Now, if you put a, a, a small microphone, a cheap microphone, just next to your engine, you can detect 99% of all the problems with that engine. It's a bit like your car mechanic. He opens the hood, listens to the engine, and says, your crankshaft is gone. Yeah, and so sometimes you think about that we need high instrumentation, but especially with, let's say, existing equipment, it is very important that we can just use simple techniques, audio, video, um, and and in, in imagery, and but these are no longer data streams to be watched or to be listened to. They are just data streams to be processed. Now, if you look at uh, you know at reInvent, I gave this talk in this big old uh, uh, sugar factory, and, and a factory like that could never be instrumented. By the way, in the US, I think the average lifetime of of current equipment in manufacturing is. 29 plus years. And you can imagine, they don't have the, the newest sensors in them. However, you can put cameras and microphones around them and actually use those as sensor streams to be able to make predictions about when, let's say, maintenance is necessary or when quality control of the products are coming out are not in the way that you want. Or you're so let me flag that, that that is actually part of your prediction number three, that pictures, video, and audio are going to speak louder than words. Amazon has been working on so many things that I've been hearing about and reinvent over the past couple of years that have to do with using AI to make sense of video, of pictures, and deploying tools to developers that allow them to take advantage of that. Why in 2021 do you see an inflection point in particular? Well, I think one of the things that we started to realize here uh, first of all, I mean, I think machine learning has reached a point that they, it becomes useful in a way that you can insert it into anything that needs low latency. You know, it, the things that have happened with machine learning is that sort of hardware and software have gone in lockstep much, much, much better. And we can do things now in real time that we, for example, wouldn't be able to do five, five years ago. Yeah? Think about tools like Alexa. Now, if Alexa doesn't respond to you within a second, it doesn't feel like a natural conversation. And so low latency matters a lot there. And, and I think especially when it comes to processing these very massive data streams, it's, um, you know, latency matters and response time, real time response matters. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges. You know, I've been talking to retailers forever. I got the question like, how do we know how customers move through our store? And I would say, probably you really know that. You have probably about 30 security cameras in your store, but you have a human watching them. Now, Imagine you would treat it as a data stream. You can start to understand how customers are moving through your store. How much time do they spend in front of this promotion? And, and, and sort of, if you make changes, what is the effect on your customers? And as such, you know, we have these traditional, what we would call traditional data streams like video and audio that are, are ideal for processing this way. And we couldn't be doing that five years ago because the hardware as well as the software wasn't there. 
So it, it's, I guess, unstructured data, right? It, it starts off unstructured, but you're able to sort of map out what you're looking at as far as exactly where in the store certain points are, you know, uh, almost like it's on a map, and then turn that into understandable data that a business can use to say, oh boy, people are stopping here and that's not where I want them to stop. People are walking past that area and really like them to pause there. How do we make changes uh, in order to, to create the experience we want? Yeah, yeah, and without having to have a focus group that actually needs to do that for you, you actually sit on the data. And I think that's one of the bigger challenge, changes that we, we've been seeing in the past years because now we generate a lot more data I mean, whether that's from your cash uh, register all the way to your security uh, cam cameras, you know, there's all these data streams that need to come together where you can make predictions about. You know, or, for example, a simple one. You know, quite a few stores have many security cameras around the checkout lines, uh, about the, the cash reg reg register. You would know immediately how long the line is at the cash register and whether you would need to open a new one. There doesn't need to be someone that actually call someone else. So you can start to understand how people move for your store. You may even may slightly, you know, make determinations about demographics and things like that. And, uh, you know, it's 12 o'clock, the high school next door goes out and suddenly you get a whole bunch of high school kids come in that have a very different behavior maybe than uh, these elderly people that may be shopping between eight and nine in the morning. That makes a lot of sense. And your uh, next prediction Let's see, what are we on? Number number four is that technology is going to transform uh, the physical world as much as our digital worlds. Uh, and, you know, coincidentally, this this flows right in with what we're talking about. But getting outside of retail, I'd like to move this into the pandemic and hopefully post pandemic world that we're moving into in 2021, when we still need to practice things like distancing when there are still precautions that need to be taken in the physical world, how is this technology going to enable that? And to what degree do you think governments and institutions have been incentivized to really deploy that because of the year we've had in 2020? Yeah, uh, for example, I mean, we developed something, of course, we, we have next to the cloud business, uh, is a, a very successful e-commerce business with many warehouses and fulfillment centers around the world. And one of our, given how essential that was for many people around the world, we also needed to make sure our workers were safe. And so we built, for example, something internally is called distance assistant. Yeah, it's basically a big screen everywhere in these fulfillment centers with a small camera on top of it, notifying our workers if they would be uh, closer than a meter and a half from each other. Yeah, and so just, just, in a funny way, with just a, a bounding box around on the, on, the, on the screen, but it helps people realize. And uh, interesting enough, for example, the city of Amsterdam here uh, picked this technology up as well and actually is deploying it around the city to actually make people aware what it means to be a meter and a half from each other. So I think, yeah, there's, there's many of these cases where to the digital, especially around um, um, around the current pandemic or current uh, say people behavior uh, might be very interesting. And so, for example, most most cities these days indeed have security cameras around around the cities. Uh, but what you can see from those from those video streams is how do people move through the street? You know, in the past you weren't worried about a meter and a half. And so, if they put all these plants here, suddenly people were forced to walk closer together. So, by actually analyzing this. You can start to understand maybe we should remove those plants or these plants need to be somewhere else or where sort of the layouts of cities start to change because you want sort of the, the, the layout to motivate people to keep distance. And I think as such, technology will be a, a crucial driver there to help people reach this awareness. Uh, another thing that's changing, uh, we're having a, a day of snow here in the New York area. I'm calling it a day of snow and not a snow day because in this pandemic, my kids are still having to go to some school because they're used to remote learning because yeah. <laughs> and, and just, the snow doesn't stop that unless the power goes out. No more snow days. <laughs> you say that 2021 is going to be a year 
when remote learning earns its place in education? That's prediction five. Do you mean well, in, a, in a cleaner way than we've got right now? How is that going to play out? No, there's, there's, there's a lot to, to, to work on, of course, still. But most importantly, I think, um, you know, we've, uh, education has always been traditional classroom-based. That means everybody has to move to a centralized place. You have to be there. And in general, education happens at the pace of the group. If you, if you listen to um, to um, Sir Ken Robinson, for example, there's great tech talks by him about, so if you really want to be effective as an educator, you need to individualize and you need to change pace for different students. And I think in this new world where remote learning still will sort of be a tool, there are opportunities there to start rethinking about sort of, is this classroom group-based sort of learning the best way to go? Because now we have opportunities to look for more individualized approaches. And I think definitely uh, the digital world will give us many more opportunities to sort of start to rethink how education is working and what the best approach is for these individual kids to learn. Um, the asynchronous nature of some online learning when it's not live really seems to me to fit in exactly with what you're talking about. If you can have kids going through certain exercises, and these programs have existed, but schools haven't necessarily taken great advantage of them. You can see who's moving through smoothly, who's having trouble in a certain area, and target certain students for individualized help, even if you're mostly operating in a live setting. Is that really the sort of thing you're talking about? Yeah, that, and I think a good example here is a company called Brainly. Uh, and they were really quite successful. You know, Brainly actually is an environment where students have trouble with particular homework questions, can ask each other for help. And they're very, very su su successful. <laughs> they already had close, I think, to 100 million uh, kids that were on the platform. Um, however, in the first three months of this year, it exploded to 300 million. Yeah, and these are, and you can imagine that it's not just, let's say, the students that are active on this platform. Teachers equally are interested in where the kids have trouble with, you know, or even textbooks publishers. Why? You know, apparently, these things in these books are not clear at all because all these kids seem to have problem with that particular question or topic. And so it at the same time creates a data-driven environment that can improve education overall. And whether that is on the individual, this kid seems to have all this trouble with when questions are being asked like, like, like this, or, you know, in a, in a much broader sense, how can we improve the overall quality of what we have to offer to, to students? Now, in prediction six, you say small businesses will race to the cloud, which in itself might not be that surprising given the rise of uh, a Shopify, uh, of Amazon's own third-party business, which we've seen continue to be strong and make up more than half of the overall volume. But then you say Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are going to lead the way on this. Why? Well, because, you know, what I've seen there is that um, there's a clear rise of using digital technology in those particular areas. And let me make a little bit of a, a, a distinction between, let's say, young businesses like startups in, in those worlds uh, versus startups in, let's say, the US and, and Europe. And yeah, there's, there's a strong focus still here, definitely in the US, on, on unicorns. And companies in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are clearly not focused on becoming a unicorn. They're focused on building a sustainable business that they can run for a longer period of, of, of time. And as such, they have a very different idea about sort of how to use technology, not build it themselves. Yeah, and if I look at sort of these, these, these small and medium businesses, um, you know, if you think about real startups, they have technologists. And if you think about the largest enterprises, they also have enough developers or partners that they can use to build their technology. For these smaller and medium businesses, uh, you know, they had, they had a PC and uh, two PCs maybe, and a guy that comes in on a Friday afternoon to do the backups. That's their IT world. But look, for example, at hospitality. You know, if in the startup world, the Airbnbs, well, I don't think Airbnb by now is a startup anymore, but you know, those, they, they're, they're really well built with technology. The same goes for you know, the Kempinskis and the Marriott's of this world that also went all, all on, the, on, on the cloud. But in the middle, they have all these small and medium and boutique hotels that kind of are not really tech, technologists. And then 
you've got software as a service companies like Hotel Logic coming coming in, who gives them exactly the same technology as the largest hotel chains have, but at a small and medium cost. And so now suddenly these small and medium hotels can insert themselves into the real-time search engines like Kayak and other that they would never be able to do before. And they don't need their PCs anymore. They just have a tablet or whatever. And so software as a service, which we normally saw as something that is really for enterprise focused, will really start uh, shifting towards uh, you know, small and medium businesses. Because that's mm -hmm. really where sort of the, 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 for some of these countries like, like Southeast Asia or like Sahara Africa, make up the majority of the businesses in those countries. Yeah, that's, um, that's a really interesting point on the global view on this trend that we see of some of these players uh, who are operating in the cloud, e-commerce, uh, and other spaces are making those tools available to smaller businesses that had really given advantage just to larger ones and newer ones. In prediction seven, you say quantum computing starts to bloom. I always get a little wary when I hear about quantum because it's always that technology that's only five years away, like for the past 20 years. Why does it start to bloom in uh, 2021? Well, what we've done at AWS is to make quantum computing available for everyone. Now, Amazon Bracket is a quantum compute service. You can sign up for that and you can start to investigate whether quantum computing is something for you. So what we've done is instead of leaving this in, in sort of the research factories, yeah, where you have to wait till this very expensive equipment comes out of the production line and, and then you as a business have to spend a lot of money on actually buying a quantum computer before you actually have figured out whether it's useful for you. And so by launching Bracket, what we've done is have multiple hardware platforms underneath there and so now companies start, can start to investigate whether this is actually technology that makes sense. A lot of development that still needs to happen. I think you know, hardware will continue to improve, but what we need to see much more improving is sort of the software environments around it. And definitely what I expect to see in the coming years that with Bracket, we now have quantum computing available for everyone and we see an acceleration happening on top of that, we sort of the software environments around it. Yeah, and whether it's, it, I mean, it's, it's obvious that a number of these areas, I mean, whether it's finance or, or life sciences or pharma or energy, all of these areas, you know, the, the truly scientific computing areas are the first ones that actually will, will be starting to make use of quantum computing, but they're still in the face of figuring out, of exploration. Does it really make sense? What do we have to develop? And how different is it from developing in the original world? And so all the great tools we have in, in let's say, the traditional compute world, we need to see that that level of tooling also becomes available for people on quantum computing. But for that, we need to know what do people really want to build with it? And by democratizing the access to quantum, we get a really good sense in that. And we then, as AWS and our partners as well, of course, can start to innovate in building the right tools to actually unlock it for many more. Now, you were just talking about the traditional world and the quantum world. In your eighth prediction, you're talking about our world and outside of our world, that space for, um, for the internet, for the transmission uh, of data and information is going to become a, a much more important frontier in 2021. What is it about the capabilities that are going to exist heading into 2021 that's going to make space uh, a more important field to invest in and, and to get benefit from in the coming year? Yeah, I, I think um, I. I I don't think you should look at it as the traditional satellites. Yeah, you should really think about micro satellites. Yeah, and so there's a few of these things where now I think sort of launching and rockets and, and reusable rockets have come to a point where it becomes, uh, let's say, cost effective to launch a rocket with basically a thousand satellites in them. Yeah, or 500. Because they're relatively small, the low orbit satellites, um, low power. And, and as such, we see a lot of these sort of dedicated new satellites being built. And whether those are research satellites, like, like tracking, what is it, glacier movements across the world and climate change, or whether they are sort of in support of 
um, you know, predicting, uh, uh, for example, crop growth or, you know, how certain areas are affected and what expected crop yields are going to be based on sort of, again, on data instead of sort of just someone looking at the past model and thinking, oh, maybe that will happen this, this year. I think it's something that has happened, has has learned us this year that we look at, look at, need to look at the reality and the data of the world right now instead of sort of using only these compute mill models what we used to do in the past. And so really moving towards data driven. And I think many of these satellites will, will be, um, will play uh, an increasingly important role because these satellites will be dedicated to one or two tasks. Um, and of course, next to that, that's the reason why we, we built our, uh, our ground stations is that for many of these younger businesses, for example, that are launching these micro satellites, you know, they can't build the ground station with all these massive antennas and things like that. So we built AWS ground station to where they could just rent some antenna time to talk to the satellites instead of having to invest in ground stations as well. Uh, the, the, what's the main selling point going to be? for customers to do that? Is it some of those very specific use cases that you talked about? You mentioned glaciers. I imagine retailers are gonna to wanna to watch parking lots to understand how to reconfigure around pickup in store, even post pandemic and, and monitor demand. Uh, is that something that you couldn't really do in the traditional world where one satellite had a whole lot to do so, uh, so that's harder? Or, or what's the big sell? I think the cost effectiveness, I think micro satellites are a fraction of the cost of the traditional old satellites that we send up in, 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 in the sky. And as such, these older satellites had to live for a very long time to make them cost effective. And, and these young, newer, younger businesses that are building these micro satellites with, let's say, not, not in necessarily uh, the, the, the complete functionality that needs to live for 25, five, five years. You know, many of the uh, many of the satellites that we still receive, let's say, our our our, our map data from, weren't launched last year. They were launched twenty years ago, and and as such, I think we we can see that there is a lot of room now for doing improvements and just being able to get these devices into space and an easy access to get their data into the cloud and process it there is definitely uh, sort of one of the bigger drivers for these new satellites. Well, and just think what you could do with it. You know? And so it, by the ability to actually launch it, something that will be cost prohibitive in the past because you need to launch these massive things. Now you can just launch a whole bunch of them and see what happens. I think all, everybody that's working, for example, on, on internet access through satellite, yeah? and whether that is you know, to, to bring basically connectivity to places where you, know, you, you can't get a fiber connection into. And all this time, we thought there were no clouds in space. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're putting them there. Uh, and eight predictions, thought-provoking for sure, that investors and followers of technology should pay attention to. Werner Vogels, CTO of Amazon. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much.